me specifically, the last thing he and I were working on um, was organizing this talk. So there's something about being here with you today that feels like a circle has been closed. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that because it's here with us. So if you all don't mind, um, I just want to close our eyes just for one little minute and breathe together and feel those things because they're happening. And sometimes art isn't always aware of mentioning these things in real time. And for me, it's important. Mm. OK. So in the spirit of a new world, which is begging to be born, um, I want to focus tonight on a specific series, Guillotine, I Want to Cry which is a series that is ostensibly looking at and considering revolution. Now, revolution has been taught to us in any number of ways, and the title of the, war, of the series makes direct reference to that. Um, at one point, um, the series had a subtitle, because as you and knows, I'm extremely wordy, um, and I love a title with like many baby titles, and I had to reel it in. But I was really thinking about, right, so it used to be called guillotine want to cry, parentheses, or why is there no guillotine emoji? Um, and I was really thinking about the lack of language we have around revolution. Um, I know that guillotine is rather severe, but it's also something that conjures up, right, historical revolution in a way that even if you haven't spent time with these sort of historical artifacts, it conjures it up. So I was really thinking about both the way it's historicized and the way that we seem to have very poor language around it in the contemporary age. The second part, Wanna Cry, um, as you probably all know and recognize, uh, is a reference to the ransomware attacks, um, which feel, of course, utterly of our moment, but also for me feel like a very apt clique, right? Like a very apt sort of heart's cry for where we sit and where we stand. So my interest in revolution um, is born of a very personal place. Um, I think that it's not the sole reason for this, but I started this inquiry around the time that I was pregnant. Um, and I was thinking a lot about the gestational qualities of that process as something that need not be bioessentialist, need not be of a female or birthing body but it could be a set of instructions for the collective building of something. And so I started becoming really invested in, okay, what is revolution to me and how have I been taught it? Um, and then I quickly realized that the way that revolution is taught for many of us is as leader events, often by a single man, um, often, often by a single white man and spending enough time with, again, artifacts and documents of past revolution, one quickly learned that revolution is rather indeterminate um, and it's rather a collective process. It's extremely messy. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of work that happens subterraneously. And to me, that became extremely exciting because there's a volatility in that process that says, this may not work out, but it still has to, we still have to try it. Um, and to me, that felt far more approachable than revolution with a capital R as we've been taught it in history books, right? I will also acknowledge that the way that revolution is historicized, whether it's by parties that are pro it or against it, and revolution certainly has very different political fixities, um, but it tends to oversimplify processes. It, always, it, it hinges on an, an explosion, a single event. Um, and while that certainly has happened, again, I'm very interested in the fact that to lead to these explosive events, there usually has to be a lot of work that happens on the underground. Um, and like most of our histories, that work is done by the poor, by women, by black and brown folks, by queer folks, so it doesn't make it into the annals of great history. So this sort of large combination of ideas and factors started me down this path of developing this work. So Guillotino Wanna Cry um, is organized around color. It was really important to me to create a anti-chronology. I didn't want to work within a 
sort of linearity that echoes the already kind of terribly precarious progress-minded time that we're already very ensconced in. Um, so I wanted the work from its inception to propose circular time or a temporality that ebbs and flows, right? Similar to these moments of organization that again can be contentious and small, but still don't make it into the sort of, you know, the through line of how revolution is remembered. So the first one, I mean, I'm using this language now because here we are living in linear time, um, but the one that I produced first is yellow. Um, and yellow really sort of sets the stage. It wants to contend with all of the things that I just mentioned, historical revolution, the way that it's been historicized, the way that we often um, don't look at what happens after revolutions, right? We often, I think, especially in um, the US American Imperial War, think of revolution as a thing of the past, right? Um, and even here, I can sort of point to this, right? This is the Politburo in Vietnam right now, which essentially had a fairly successful revolution, although it was terribly thwarted by US American efforts, right? So I wanted to feel like revolution was sort of ongoing in the past and in the future. And these four protagonists that you see in this scene are negotiating their own kind of physicality with these artifacts. So I start to think of the historical documents that I bring in as both antagonists and protagonists of the work. The four characters um, speak from very different subject positions, and this is as an effort to sort of thwart my own directorial role in the work. Now, yes, I am an artist. I'm the one who kind of came up with the idea and put, put all these people in a room together. I have to acknowledge that. But beyond that, I want this project to really say that I personally don't know what these gestational conditions are, but that I'm really interested in figuring them out together. So I'm really interested in a plural, choral capacity of many voices. Sometimes the voices become absurd. Sometimes they speak over each other. Sometimes they're not even talking about the same thing remotely. Um, and to me, coaxing this absurdity is a really important part of like calling to light this idea again of indeterminacy and also hopefully opening in the audience the space for what we might call radical imagination. Now, I think that this is a phrase that is often overused, um, but to me it's really important because I think of imagination as something that has been sort of taught out of us, right? Like it's, it's, it's given to the, it's relegated to the realm of children, to the realm of play. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin very, I'm gonna quote her several times, um, but Ursula K. Le Guin very brilliantly says that because capitalism hasn't figured out a way to monetize imagination, it has done away with it. Um, and what I really sort of take from that is that imagination, yes, is our daily ability to sort of daydreaming and imagine certain things within the context of our lives, yes. But I think also imagination is the kind of duty, the kind of evolutionary um, inheritance we have, really, to look at a set of problems and consider that nothing that we've tried is working and completely new things must be tried. And I really believe that the solution is like, in our collective minds on our planet, but it, ha but it doesn't exist materially yet. And so this call for radical imagination is not something flimsy or to be taken lightly. It's something that I think is extremely difficult work, but that I also believe is possible. Um, so these four characters in their kind of vocal capacity are there to sort of share that. So I'll quickly run through what they all do. Um, so this character um, is titled The Bone Collector. Also, by the way, when we look at the work all of these things are much more underground than might appear, but between us, I'll tell you all the secrets. Um, so he only speaks in comments from YouTube videos, um, generally in response to sort of a very specific type of political video that exists on YouTube, but sometimes talking about bands as well. Um, she speaks only in voices from relatively well-known revolutionary leaders, particularly from South America, so Che Guevara, um, Fidel Castro, sometimes Fanon. Um, this character only speaks in voices pulled from psychics in reality TV. Um, and then my character,
character because I was pregnant at the time um, and sort of really contending with that sort of interior and exterior life really um, pulls a lot of her uh, language from Adrian Riches of Women Born. Now again, it's really important for me to stress that I'm not looking to motherhood as again a bioessentialist, like only of the realm of women work, but rather trying to use the language that exists for that, the language that Rich uses to speak about that experience to talk about our collective task of creativity. Something that I really love in Rich's work is that she's constantly talking about the demands of the world for her while she's very busy with many children um, to write more poetry. And there's something about that too, right? That the I sort of substitute poetry in this work to be kind of the call that I think a lot of us have to move ourselves into action and change the world. Um, the sets, uh, well, I'll talk about the costuming quickly, sorry. The costuming, you know, you can't escape all of the references. So um, the costuming is quite indebted to Russian constructivist design. Um, I really wanted it to feel like my characters were working. Um, so they're all wearing work clothes, um, but the room starts to kind of decompose what this idea of work is or could be. So I developed this room. I wanted it to feel extremely analog, even though it's shot on, on digital video. So the skylights above us are gelled yellow. Everything is subtly lit with yellow lights. And it's very subtle, but I wanted it to feel like the room itself was unstable. For me, this idea of ambiguity and instability is a place to kind of decenter us together. And I think that it's scary, but that's the place where it happens. Um, so I wanted this room to feel Possibly, as the title suggests, like maybe the break room where these workers come after a shift to sort of sit around, but things are definitely not what they seem in here. Why are there roses? Are there roses left over from a party? Um, as I mentioned, my references are pulling from all over the place, so I don't know if you know, but this is Real Housewives of New Jersey, um, and this is a very stressful scene where <laughs> these two main housewives are having like a really intense fight, and in the background, this man is anxiously ripping the petals from all of these roses. <laughs> and so that felt really important to me <laughs> to bring into the work. This idea of all of us witnessing change and not knowing what to do and that creating a certain level of anxiety, because again, the work is not trying to be prescriptive or in any way say that the sort of whole gamut of emotions isn't present. Um, so there's certainly a lot of instability um, that occurs in the work. The other thing that you'll notice is that the characters come in one at a time and they each perform these pretty tight solos, um, each in very different styles. I really, when I collaborate with dancers, I really give them just a set of kind of textural notes um, and then let them respond with what talents they have. I tend to not choreograph people. Um, and so they each come in with these very tight solos but they're kind of bumping into each other in the room, like nothing quite works. And then by the end, we all kind of collapse together into a very improvised, like collective choreography that is in some ways ugly, right? It's in some ways indeterminate. And we're all struggling to follow one another, but there are these sort of moments where it happens. And again, it's a way of me showing very directly through the idea of mimicry, right? I'm not saying that we are doing, we're not doing revolution. Right, but we are like attempting at a language for it. Um, and so that's a way for me to sort of bring it into the choreography itself. Um, like I mentioned, um, found footage of revolution, um, of meetings becomes extremely important um, to the work. So the, cha the piece is in three channels. Um, and then there's these times when the, all the channels kind of come together. Um, another sort of important, I think, thing to mention is you'll notice that there's this sort of blurring of faces that happens. Um, this is done for dual reason. Um, for one, like I said, I'm trying to actively combat this idea of revolution as being uh, leader or individualistic. Uh, and then the other thing is that when I started producing this work, it was in the middle of the 2020 uprisings, and there were many folks that were protesting for the first time, and that was really amazing. But because we live in the era of Instagram, they were also making a lot of images from these protests and weren't following kind of basic protocol, which was don't show protesters' faces because that can help in making arrests. Um, 
So to me, the blurring has this dual capacity of sort of dis dislocating this notion of leadership um, and also of protection. So it sort of serves as like a spell of protection in a way. I'm gonna go for a couple more slides. And again, I'm really moving um, through time. I'm not gonna talk too much about my science fictional work, but I still, even when I'm doing this kind of work, to me this work is set like seven years in the future, right? Like I never operate in our contemporary timeline because I'm always looking for the liberatory possibility of the future. Um, and so the work moves through time, but it's also wanting to be really cognizant of any kind of movement. So, you know, you have revolts in Nicaragua here, but then this is the LA riots, which happened um, in the 90s. This is a very preliminary installation. I'm looking forward to redoing this with my, this was done by a lovely team of preparators when I wasn't on site. Um, but just showing a little bit that my ideal for most of my video work is for the work to exist with installation elements that recall the work. You can hardly see it here, but this is a little petal, a little rose petal mountain. Um, okay, so pardon my jumping around screens, um, but I want to show you, oh my goodness, it's already, I want to show you some video. Um, so again, this piece is about 25 minutes long, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, um, but I am going to let some excerpts ride out for a while, because I think it's time-based, right, like time is the medium. Um, I'm going to open with this introduction, which I think really sets us up for this notion of absurdity. I can talk a little bit about how this text was formed later. Um, yeah, here we go. Jorm, the snake or spit. Oh, well, that looks very crunchy. I refuse. I reject it. Um, is it going to make me refresh? It's just bedroom. Masoretic texts won't find information healthy the shores, but each debris was changed into holiday hangouts. Models from public, private entrances, Wi-Fi, LCD televisions, Patton, Blind Mullow, who scales as they can, citing Emily, themselves in Food Chapter 6. Models, however, is tremendous team with. Replaces Banana Way's pound university of stress. VPF formalism to quantum mechanics, advance the journey. Journal takes a transporting goods such relevant. Fruity fragrance, just conventionally, but you'll notice many even. Opal Garnet House did Mary Barber. Cosmic consciousness in one inventory's to caliber. Don't Dalai Lama this game then twice. Old to be in picture faster. Represents one reason for easy and bad over the stress. Is real. 
Heaven has technology, and I've proved it. One must always try to be as radical as reality itself. Girl, I've tested it enough to make sure that it is tried and true. Don't tempt me. Don't get me started. I had a friend in grade school. We both had older brothers who introduced us to them, and we bonded over the music as well as other things. He died of an accidental fall in a state park when he was 13. The song was played at his funeral. Today would have been his 38th birthday. Love and miss you. You are not a little girl anymore. You haven't been a little girl in a very long time. What people think or say about it is totally irrelevant. You really are a sweetheart. The group consciousness of this thread of grateful fans is my proof that there is a God, and he is glad we can relate to the beauty this world can offer. We're not supposed to be good. We're supposed to be really, really bad in a controlled setting. UN, Black Colonial Subjects participate, dealing with, analyzing, rejecting, litigating, drawing the racist atrocities of this black nation. And yet, somehow, something, of the nature of that fucking fatalism of the human creature, makes me aware of the inevitable as already part of me, not to be contended against, but not just brought to bear as an additional weapon against drift, stagnation, and spiritual death.
parallel life of this project is this book. Um, so I was very lucky to be asked by a local publisher called Kruskaya. I don't know if you folks know them. It's a wonderful set of three poets. Um, and they usually just publish poetry, but were interested in working with artists. So they made this really beautiful box set um, that I was very lucky to be a part of. And so I produced this book, Everything Must Go, which really plays with this idea of the performance itself being us attempting to kind of, through absurdity, break into a new mode of thinking. And so it presents, this book presents itself as a manual, in a sense, for anyone who would want to restage this performance. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that people are gonna, on their own, wanna restage this performance, right? But the idea in presenting it as a script is to really lay bare sort of the tools of this process and again consider us partners in us freeing ourselves right from the binds of race gender and class this notion of ambiguity and absurdity and most importantly attempt right so the notion as you saw by the end right the sort of collapsing choreography kind of calls to mind this idea of an attempt and the attempt you know at the end of the piece is not there's no real and again, this is me sort of sidestepping an authorial vision of this because I really don't think that we get to this place by sort of individual channels. And so the book um, wants to kind of bring that to the fore. It also includes some of my research. Um, I really invite you to read this gem. Um, and it includes some of my research, not just in a sort of textual way, right, but also in terms of, again, the more ineffable things, right? Like, don't we all have that folder on our computers, JP just saw me stash mine, um, of like images and strange things that call to us. And I really think these artifacts kind of, I don't know, become part of a puzzle, part of like a cosmology that we're all kind of living with it, but struggle to articulate. Um, and so I think of all of these things as part of, of the choir, if you will. Um, there are some instructions, right? So this idea that the audience will never really know what is happening, um, our options really in approaching it. Um, and so the work starts to function, hopefully, like a play within a play, and it entangles the audience in the possibility of restaging it so many times that like something new is born. the way that the series is ordered and organized is around color. And I started to work after a yellow. Yellow sort of, again, takes the idea, I had to kind of face the idea of what the standing images and textures and stories of revolution that we all kind of live with are, and had to make these characters kind of walk through them. And so with the ones that I'm building now, um, I'm thinking a little bit more specifically in two different areas of inquiry and research. And so green, um, I finished in 2022, um, although it's still, you know, my work is never really finished. This was done for a commission for Tufts University, and I'll show you how that all looked in installation later. Um, but this work was really written thinking about the Caribbean, so I'm actually staging it as a live performance uh, with the Contemporary Art Museum in Puerto Rico at the end of next summer, and that will certainly be a really different work than this, um, because this work, as you can imagine, is really grounded in place. So Green um, is really looking at the imperial colonial view that conflates the racialized other with the land, with place. Um, and I'm looking at how that determination is essentially the seeding place for extractive practices that have harmed humans through the invention of slavery, through the eradication of indigenous people, um, as well as the destruction of many, many, many untold non-human lives, right? So I'm looking both at the creation of that ideology and sort of contra like battling it while also suggesting that it was at that very moment that we as a species um, stopped seeing ourselves as networked with the land, right? 
right? So I'm sitting on this very sharp edge of a sword where I'm looking at the invention, essentially, of race. And if you look at, you know, Stuart Hall and a great other number of theorists, the invention of racial capitalism, um, while also looking at where we stand, looking back on this from a perspective of climate and acknowledging that that was also the moment where there was a misunderstanding of our place in the world, right? Because of white supremacy dictating these rules as being very divisive. Uh, again, so that extractivist practices could crop up. Um, so that was sort of where the work originates. Um, and so the first thing that became apparent to me is that I couldn't really construct a set for this. It had to be in the land, right? Land as protagonist. Um, and so green gets its name again from this conflation, but also from place itself. Um, I think another important thing to note here is that my research into this work by necessity becomes highly specific, whereas the other one I'm sort of pulling from a global sort of set of concerns. Um, I still am, I'm an internationalist at heart, um, but my experience kind of comes into play a little bit more specifically because of my own specific subjectivity as an Afro-Indigenous person from the Caribbean. Um, so this work for me really seeds out of the Caribbean. I argue in it that the Atlantic slave trade sort of uses the Caribbean as a kind of pinhole through which it expands on either side. Um, and then the research sort of expands out from there. So there's quite literally um, references made to maritime diaries from, from 1492 and on, um, and then references to poets like Derek Walcott or Alice Walker, um, and then as well as instances of rebellion that again expand out from the Caribbean, go through the southern United States, come over to California, um, and expand as far as say the forest of Kashmir where there's currently an ongoing battle over um, land and indigenous people. Um, again, this work is very different in the way that it's really grounded in place and I wanted text to play a really important role in this because I'm really thinking about language and the creation of language as another place where our imagination can both flower and also be limited. Um, and I was very lucky to collaborate with two dancers for this work, um, Rashawn Mitchell and Meg Jala, um, who I, one of them who I knew from previous work and one who I didn't. And I only mention these things because I think it's important that my collaborative process in some ways mirrors the world I want to build. So the way that I usually get performers is I put a call into the world and then whoever kind of responds to it comes to the work. Um, so it's really important to me that the world building in the work is begins in the production of it. Um, the process sort of mirrors it. Getting ahead of myself. Um, so for this one, um, this is the 35 minute work, which for me these are really short. Um, but for you, they're very long. Um, so I'm just gonna play a few excerpts. This is the beginning. I think it's important to note that because I'm in this negotiation of what is a human presence in the land um, and how that has both led to collaborations, right? So this work really looks at, I can't believe I didn't say this, it's a very important part. What it really looks at is rebellion organized in collaboration with the land. So it's looking a lot at Simarronaje, which is sort of the legacies of runaway slaves in the Caribbean and um, in parts of South America. Um, the formation of communities within land as a protective space from which to organize out of, as well as indigenous populations across the Caribbean and South America, et cetera, um, who both sheltered in the land as a collaborator and partner at times also in joy and rejoicing. So the piece is split into three acts, and in the first act, which is where we're gonna start, there's still really no humans um, on the land. So each character is actually kind of an embodiment of three different um, forms. One of them is stone, one of them is leaf, and one of them is seed. And these were the instructions that I also gave to the other per, uh, performers and collaborators. So I, you know, you'll see it when we get into the choreographed bits, but I talked to Rashawn about, okay, you're stone, so like, what does that mean? Like, you started out as a pebble, maybe you've become a mountain, the mountain has crumbled, what has it witnessed? And so I say this to say that I'm also kind of playing with maybe unorthodox language around even the formation of the kind of practical elements of 
the piece as a way of attempting, um, again, some disintegration within the medium that we all know really well, right? So like if Jorshan's a really excellent dancer, I want him to approach dancing through a kind of different lens. So that's all setting up this opening a little bit. We 
of no transition, no sensation of falling. I was on my back, with the light speeding down into my face and all the vertical things above me. The universe, which is not really the stars and the moon and the planets, flowers, grass and trees, but other people, has evolved no terms for your existence, has made no room for you. And if love will not swim wide the gates, no other power will or can. Sun, 
wanna ask you to join the moon Girl, I understand But when I wait by now Says it's time to drown so and so Don't become the dog that becomes stone Waiting for its master Which in Spanish is amo Amo, amo How can that word be both And embrace Slavery itself C1A, Indiana, hear me sing. The hexagram says to bite hard. The hexagram says to bite hard. The hexagram says to bite hard. Seriously? Yes. 
with the fake Chanel outfit on. That ain't real. It's a dream. It's a mirage. Just a work of art. I got you. Turn off the cameras for a little while so we can actually have fun. Yes, there's in cameras everywhere. I don't give a bleep about those cameras. She catches a shark after it is all said or done. As it fights her over big waves, she says as she pulls, I need the sisterhood. Oh, how incredible our hairdo is. Most divine. And so I'm sort of thinking of these kind of 
in the like, quick and fleeting moments as possible moments of recognition of our possible collaborators and sort of creating this new world. Um, and so that series was in the space. Um, and then quickly and lastly, this was sort of an accompanying interview that was produced for the work. And I only mention it because it was really important for me that this exhibition happened within a university setting, which means that the exhibition building had to be, by definition, really different. Um, and I didn't want it to flatten it or have it become didactic or educational, but I wanted it, I wanted my research to be shared um, in a really different way. And so I'm sharing it as a way of kind of pointing out the ways in which uh, publications have a way of extending the life of a work. Um, so we're really truly about to be out of time, but I want to show you something that's kind of funny and I wouldn't always, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really show this in any other talk. <laughs> dare you add, how dare you ruin this for me. Um, so I'm sharing something that I produced. This was my first work in music, um, and I did this while I was a student here. So I kind of feel like it's returning at home in some ways. Um, so when I was here, I did this body of work where I really didn't know anything about music production or performance or any of those things, but felt very hamstrung by kind of the demands of the academy, the demands of the academy for me specifically as someone who was working with photography, and I felt like I couldn't really explore my subjectivity within that. Um, and so I started a band that was an alter ego and then became a band, and now all of the scoring that we do is done by this 